In June 1948, the government designated the area now known as Glenrothes for the development of a new town. I'm not being unfair to the other new towns. There's no other new town you can get the kind of views you can get from the northern fringe of Glenrothes. We look down over the town and down to the fourth. And the fact that we have landscaped, and I think my predecessors have a lot to be uh, congratulated on. They have landscaped this town in a way no other new town can landscaped. Glenrothes Development Corporation were given the task of bringing this dream of a new community to reality and created what their last head of planning, Alex Winton, called a town amongst trees. For the newcomer driving through Glenrothes, there may seem to be a distinct lack of housing. This is due to an early planning concept, to separate housing areas from main roads. Development of the new town began in 1951, when the Development Corporation started to build houses beside Woodside Village. This first residential area of Glenrothes provided housing initially for miners and their families who would work in the East Fife coal fields. The Rothes Colliery was the new town's raison d'etre. The first new homes in Woodside complemented the older style of the village by the use of harled exteriors, dormer windows and steep pitched roofs. Open space was incorporated to provide privacy from adjacent roads and in one area a quasi-private space was created utilising beech trees and a spacious lawn. Development of the new town proceeded in a westerly direction and the Ochmuti area quickly followed on the heels of Woodside. The innovative housing design in this area won the 1955 Saltire Award. In support of the growing community, the first neighbourhood shops sprung up in 1953 and were followed by another 12 shops within the next year. Primary and nursery schools were opened, playing areas were provided and in 1957 Ochmuti Secondary School opened. At the same time, the development of the £14 million Rothes Colliery advanced and it also opened in 1957. A royal visit in 1958 by Her Royal Highness Queen Elizabeth II and the Duke of Edinburgh lifted Glenrothes to the forefront of the news, gaining national exposure. This royal visit gave rise to the naming of the town's first industrial estate, Queensway. The development corporation, keen to avoid becoming reliant on a single industry, attracted other industrial investors to the town. 1958 saw the arrival of the Scottish Milk Marketing Board and the provision of a variety of advanced factories and small start-up units with room for expansion. Industries continued to be attracted to the town. Beckman Industrial Limited in 1958, Hughes Microelectronics in 1960, Tockheim Limited in 1961 and BMAT and Buco Limited in 1963. These new companies, along with the three major paper-making firms that had traditional roots in the area, Tullus Russell, Smith Anderson and J.W. Dixon, now Sappy Graphics, laid the foundation for a balance in economic activity. This diversification was to prove an enlightened strategy in hindsight. The Kingdom Centre, as it is now known, was initially established with a group of 14 shops Another ten were added later to serve the expansion of the town at Rimbledon and South Parks. The town centre continued to take shape as residential precincts, industrial estates and the multi-storey development of Rayburn Heights began to surround it. By the time of the official opening of the Kingdom Centre Phase 1 in December 1964, it contained 27 shops, a co-op emporium, a new post office and office spaces. The early 60s saw Glenrothes flourish, with individual areas expanding and the road system rapidly improving. Housing kept a pace with subtle changes taking place in layout form, but it was not until the fifth precinct in the outline plan, Macedonia, that distinct differences began to occur in form and layout. This precinct was based on a unique spoke and wheel design. It has a school at its hub, with streets running to it from the main encircling road, and footpaths providing alternative segregated access from the roads. 
Designers gave the two-storey terrace blocks an array of different features, including wood panelling, coloured harling and porches. The original Glenrothes outline plan predicted a total population of 32,000, and by 1961 the town had reached a population of 13,300. But that same year the town was rocked by what was thought to be a major blow, the shock closure of the Rothes colliery. Glenrothes raison d'etre had gone, and its new role as a manufacturing town would have to take on a new emphasis. By 1963, Glenrothes was identified as a growth point for attracting and developing a diversified industrial and commercial base. Any reminder of the past was finally erased when the twin towers of the Rothes colliery were levelled in 1993. In support of this new role, Viewfield, the town's second industrial estate, was opened. By 1963, the first premises were occupied by Robertson and Ferguson Limited steel fabricators. Development of other companies such as Sandusky, Stowe Woodward and Brandrex at Viewfield signalled a move to manufacturing as the predominant industry. Efforts to diversify the employment base really took off when Glenrothes became the first new town to have its own airstrip when Fife Airport opened in August 1964. Then, in 1964, the Cadco fiasco almost brought the new town to its knees, with its combination of Hollywood hype and tabloid nightmare. Growing prospects for a huge food processing plant, garnished with a variety of other developments, such as a film studio, collapsed, and created a tidal wave of controversy throughout Scotland. However, Glenrothes ultimately emerged from the affair stronger than ever with a variety of industries and Benno Schultz's creation, Ex Terra, with its message of growth from the ground, symbolised Glenrothes gaining strength from this adversity. It was also a beginning of what is now a town tradition for innovative sculptures. By the mid-1960s, the corporation had completed its 5,000th house and the milestone of over 1 million square feet of factory space. Industrial growth continued with the likes of Burroughs Machines and GI Microelectronics opening. The 1960s may have seen the end of one era, but it heralded the beginnings of another. Over the decade, there was a remarkable increase in car ownership. The number of working hours was generally reduced and leisure time increased. The corporation's challenge for the next decade would be to retain a flexible approach to create the opportunities to allow industry the elbow room and environment to expand and keep pace with the changing face of education and the general revolution in people's lifestyles. The town continued to grow in the 70s and by its 25th anniversary had a population of 30,000. Community centres sprang up at Glenwood and the Lowman Centre while Warout Football Stadium boasted its own grandstand and club rooms. Open parks and pedways connected these leisure facilities to the residential areas. One of the largest of this network of pedways is Boblingen Way, named after Glenrothes twin town in Germany. It has also been used as part of the course for the long-running Glenrothes Hughes Half Marathon. Fife Sports Institute with its swimming pool was opened in June 1970 and provides facilities for a wide range of sports and leisure activities for all levels of ability. Recently, all-weather pitches have been provided to meet local and regional demand for tennis, football and hockey. As the second phase of the town centre was officially opened in July 1976, Fife Regional Council moved their headquarters to Glenrothes. The mid-1970s saw development move north of the River Leven, Varying terrain produced different approaches to development layouts, and housing in particular was tailored to match these challenges. By March 1977, 10,000 houses had been completed. Job growth in the town reflected the vagaries of the national economic performance, but even in the recession-hit period of the 70s, around 400 new jobs were created every year. As the town moved into the 80s, its peripheral geographic location, combined with further recession, slowed this growth. The effect of the closure of boroughs, for example, was felt throughout the industrial community. 
But despite the reductions in job growth, employment still rose, partly due to the corporation's dogged determination and what Professor Kit Blake, the corporation's chairman, called its street fighter mentality to survive. The fact that development continued despite no major road link to the national road network until 1990, when the East Fife Regional Road was completed, demonstrates the tenacity of both the private and public sectors of the town. Housing growth continued to the north of the River Leven, and there was an upsurge in private housing developments. This, and the introduction of the right to buy, saw a steady increase in the proportion of privately owned homes within the Newtown area. For example, almost 2,000 corporation houses were sold between 1984 and 1986. Substantial additional private housing sites were released for development in the mid to late 1980s in the Finglasse area of the town. Industrial development continued with significant expansion in Southfield, Eastfield and Woodgate. The infrastructure provision kept pace with development and public transport routes expanded to link the developing residential and industrial areas of the town with the town centre. The 1992 expansion and upgrading of the town centre bus station continued the commitment of service for the residents of Glenrothes. From the first town planner to the last, the principle of providing open woodland and open spaces throughout the town has been put into practice. This commitment is as evident today, with over a third of the town being devoted to open space and woodland, and the establishment of community woodlands with the Woodland Trust. The town park is as much a centrepiece today as it was in the original 1951 plan. I think it's very difficult actually for people coming into this area really just to envisage the social conditions that obtained in many of these mining villages years ago when there were miners rose. There was no beauty in the area. People were living and working, you know, in the shadow of Pip Bing the whole of their life. And there can be no shadow of it. The new town is a really beautiful place. The Balburnley Park policies were purchased in 1968 and included over 400 acres of parkland. It has been developed to include a prestigious 18-hole golf course, a hotel converted from an A-listed 18th century mansion house, a caravan park and a craft centre. The surrounding landscape is home to one of the finest rhododendron collections in Britain. Developments such as this mean the children and grandchildren of Glenrothes families will for years to come enjoy peaceful walks through Glenrothes' impressive woodlands and open spaces. The changing face of industry meant further developments at Eastfield, Whitehill, Southfield and Bankhead. The first phases of Fife Food Centre opened in Southfield around 1987. And by the end of the 80s, the town launched an out-of-centre retail park with major retailers Texas and MFI establishing themselves at the Saltar Centre. In the drive towards the new, not all that is old has been lost. Balfarg is the site of a prehistoric ceremonial complex dating from before 4000 BC. Much of it has been built over, but extensive archaeological excavations were carried out between 1970 and 1985. The Henge has been retained as a feature within the Balfarg housing area and creates a historical link between the past and present of Glenrothes. The collection of public town art has been both an inspiration and a topic of conversation for both local residents and visitors. The town artists have left a colourful imprint on the community with a range of over 100 art forms from a parade of hippos to the world famous Good Samaritan sculpture. The regional council's core operation continued to expand and the extension to Fife House was completed. This addition is a blend of functional design and modern architectural ingenuity. Utilising reflective glass and lightweight materials, Fife House seems to float beside the heavier structures nearby. In July 1989, the government white paper, The Way Ahead, announced the impending wind-up of the development corporation. 
The corporation, in order to fulfil its remit to complete the new town, undertook a final development programme of industrial development, housing, open space and infrastructure. Maintain momentum is the phrase the civil servants use. That means once you've got a town up and running with industrial development coming all the time, it's to keep that going after, we, after the corporation goes, because the corporation has been effectively the engine of growth. You know, we're not just um, housing landlords. We've actually built an industrial base here, and it's to keep that going. That, that, that's the task for the future. The East Fife Regional Road was finally completed in July 1990 and meant that Glenrothes was no longer on the periphery of Scotland's central belt. A 2.75 kilometre length of single carriageway road, the Glenrothes Western Distributor Road Phase 2, was needed to complete the final link in the New Towns Highway Network. This included a new Riverside Park crossing. After careful consideration of the bridge crossing site, a cabled stayed bridge design was chosen to not only enhance the town park, but to distinguish Glenrothes from all other new towns in Scotland. The River Leven Bridge is the first major all-reinforced concrete deck cable stayed bridge to be constructed in Europe, and it was completed on schedule in October of 1995. Confidence continued in the town's ability to attract inward investors. Cannon was drawn to Westwood Park, not only because of its strategic location, but also because of the excellent local workforce. The Kingdom Centre was finally completed in 1993. Its most recent addition incorporates floor designs and white wall tiling, giving a modern, spacious effect. Lion Square has undergone a facelift, bringing it up to the same standard as the new additions, meaning today's shoppers can enjoy a spacious, modern environment. To provide the town with a community heart, the Development Corporation included the construction of Rothes Halls in the final phase of the Kingdom Centre. This provides two venues. The larger holds 1,000 people, while the smaller hall will take 200. There are also meeting rooms, seminar and business facilities, and a cafeteria. The complex also includes a new central library and tourist office. Never losing sight of the past, the hall displays a sculpture paying tribute to the area's industrial heritage. Looking back over its history, the men and women of the Glenrothes Development Corporation should be proud of their accomplishments. From its early beginnings at Woodside, the town has reached a population of 40,000. The plan is nearing completion and the town has been laid out in a harmony that is sometimes taken for granted. As the new town nears the millennium, Glenrothes is slowly coming of age. Many of those families who arrived in the 1950s have realised their hopes and dreams. But the new town is no more, and Glenrothes has truly become a town in its own right, with a spirit and tradition that is normally only gained through age and history. The corporation has fulfilled the dream of those original planners of 1948 by securing the future of the town's natural heritage. Planners may have laid the foundations of the town, but it is the people of Glenrothes who have developed and will continue to develop a sense of civic pride. It is the people who are the true spirit of Glenrothes. Glenrothes has proved to be the real growth point as far as Fife is concerned is possibly the biggest economic asset that's ever come into this county from time immemorial. <laughs>